Okay, to keep this as condensed as possible, we're going to put together both the review of the first unknown as well as the preparation of the first lab practical. The reason why we actually do this together is because obviously the first unknown is kind of a process of putting everything together that you learned so far and then putting it into practice, whereas the lab practical usually is just an examination of it. So as always, I wanna kind of give you an idea of what we're trying to do. And unknowns are always part of the microbiological kind of course type training in which we're trying to help you figure out what type of diseases are out there and how to kind of analyze them, discuss them, and possibly even treat them in the future. And so we know this as a subject called etiology. And so this is something we're gonna end up learning later on in the course, but this is kind of your first taste for it. And so you're kind of putting together, again, all the skills that you've learned so far and turning it into a little bit of a small kind of Sherlock Holmes type project in which you're going to come up with ideas and possible solutions to a particular problem while kind of giving you the training wills for the second and none, which is a much larger project, much more independent project for it. So this is the baby steps for it. Uh, the idea is very simple, uh, just like you would do in any medical field, uh, the concept is to come up with um, a logical step-by-step -step reasoning for a particular type of disease. And so as healthcare providers, which hopefully most of us are planning on being in the future, um, we try and do this not out of just second guessing ourselves or even just randomly postulating things, rather we use all the experiences we've had. And for us, so far, we spent a good amount of labs kind of dealing with microscopy and looking at shapes, for example, discerning not only colony shapes and the macromorphology, but also in the uh, micromorphology, looking at if they're spherical or they're rod shaped or if they're in little chains or in little clusters, while also combining it with your ability to stain that helps us tell certain structures or whether or not it has a complex wall. And we also kind of played around also looking at things like whether they move or not. That's kind of the overarching idea. And so in this case, we're going to test all those skills that we learned so far for the last few weeks by putting it together into a project called an unknown project. And so we're going to try and figure out the identity specifically of a sample that we would normally provide you. And you're going to figure out what it is based on all the properties that you already know. Now, putting this together um, right before we do the lab practical material is because this kind of serves as a little bit of a review for it too. Why? Because what a lab typically does is something that we know in our wonderful little circle of uh, academics as KSAs, which stand for knowledge, skills, and abilities. And so I'll explain through this little by little, but that's really what you're uh, learning in practice, but also what will go into the practical ultimately, and we'll do some examples a little bit later. So normally when we're not in remote conditions or in remote times, this project is done by starting off attending the first session, and we give you a uh, two with just an ID number, no information into it, and we tell you, hey, figure out what's inside of it based on what you know. And so we give you a grand total of about an hour or so to perform several different experiments that you've already learned, like the stains, like the motility, like understanding the pigment and using your microscope kind of stuff. And figure out what it is inside that sample. So you're kind of supposed to ID it. And the way you normally do that is by creating a flow chart, something that again, you're gonna to learn to do today. We're gonna to kind of go through some examples. And in reality, like I said, it's preparation for the second unknown, which is a much, much bigger project. Now, since we're trying to, again, keep you safe and reduce the amount of time that you're in, on campus, we've kind of come up with a, a digital version that kind of changes it just a little bit. And so rather than giving you an actual sample, what we're gonna do is do this digitally. And so we will give you a number, an ID, a bit of information, and you're gonna actually solve it just in the same way you would do it in real life using a flowchart and everything else. And even though there might be multiple solutions, we only require you to do one of them. And so we're gonna give you a pre-built flowchart for y'all. And uh, we're gonna actually give you an idea of the organism. And this is usually a sign on the day of. 
And then the idea is so that you can figure out throughout the pathways of that flow chart, which type of test would you perform, which type of results you're supposed to get, but also at the same time explain the reasoning, the logic of why those results and why those tests were performed. That's what you're supposed to be doing, All right? So uh, what we're gonna try and do then this session specifically is give you just a basic understanding of how the unknown works. We're going to give you a little bit of review, both kind of double-sided through this kind of preparation. We're gonna practice creating some of the flow charts really quick. And then at the end, we'll just spend a few minutes going through some basics for the lab practical. And when we come back next session, we're gonna assign that ID that I just mentioned a little bit earlier. You will go through lab 47, which is our first unknown. And then you will have time to complete the lab practical just like you've done in remote conditions uh, through all the same set of rules, through Zoom, through Canvas, all the same stuff you've done. And that'll complete the lab itself. Now, normally, like I said, in a real uh, in-person situation, the very first session, like today, basically, everybody shows up and performs a quiz, which requires a 75% or greater uh, passing score. So we know that you know what you're doing. And then we'd assign you roughly about an hour to perform the tasks. You would obtain an actual sample. You would perform all the labs that are available in that flowchart. That typical uh, flowchart is provided to you in the lab supplement or in some sort of handout form. And then throughout that entire time that is remaining, you complete all the tests that are uh, required. Now, because motility usually requires a 24 to 48 hour um, incubation period, some of these may require you to complete them on the second session. Now, that's not for everybody, but it does apply for somebody. Uh, some, of the, some of you, sorry. And then once you complete those, then everybody begins the lab practical on the second session. And then still giving you a couple of days to complete your standard report which is usually your UR1 or unknown report number one. That's more or less the breakdown of the, the in-person unknown. And so during the day, uh, we get you just like as usual, we get your PPE, you disinfect your benches, all that good stuff, right, really quick. And then, like I said, you end up performing a quiz that is done for that. And then we give you a heads up of where uh, items are located, any warnings, that kind of thing we collect your sample or we assign your sample for you. And then you perform your gram stain, which is usually where we start with every single procedure in microbiology, just in general. And then we give you the remainder of the time to complete the other tests. Now, because it is a timed event, just trying to mimic uh, real life events kind of thing, you know, you have a schedule to complete. Again, this is set to be completed in roughly about an hour. If you start going over that hour, uh, hour time frame, then you start losing points. So it is very, very structured in terms of how we work with these. Again, just like if it would be in a real life situation. Now for us, our protocol has been modified. And so there's gonna be a component that is email based. I'll explain that in a moment. It's still gonna be timed, right? Um, and you're gonna rely more or less on images if you need to get some results. I'll explain those in a moment too. And then in the same way, just like before, we would have a quiz ready for you just to make sure you know what you're doing rather than kind of uh, running around like a headless chicken kind of thing. Now, the overall idea is that we wanna continue to do the same thing we did with the uh, in-person one, that we're out there to kind of test all the stuff that you learned so far, right? And in the real life situation, we would test you for things like maintaining safety, making sure you're cleaning up, knowing where you put your gloves, uh, knowing where the glass disposal is, et cetera, et cetera. And then also looking at your ability to follow the protocol, right? Same things that are gonna go also into your lab practical in case you're wondering. But since these projects are meant to be individual, this is done all on your own. So that means you get to rely only on your own notes and your documents that you've provided, your manual, your notebook, your supplement, but you're not allowed to kind of converse with anybody or interact with anybody. This is a um, self-reliant uh, project, basically. And then more or less what we're looking to figure out, just like we would do in real life, is do you understand what's the point behind every experiment that you learned so far? What is the big deal associated with it? and then your ability to demonstrate your skill. So did you learn the things that we train you to do 
during our in-person labs. And so we normally provide you a handout that you should already have access to. Your job will then be to solve that uh, document that we provided you with, which contains the flowchart. And for the digital version of this, uh, you're gonna, rather than actually perform the experiments, you're gonna describe how the pathway flows. So rather than actually doing experiment with experiment, here you're gonna write about it. And so you're gonna complete this brief report this is gonna be your unknown report one, right? In which you talk about what pathway you had to take to solve it, what did you use to solve it, and why did you choose to solve those? And that's what ends up providing you your final report. And all of these instructions, again, are already uh, on Canvas as a handout, and some of it is described in your lab supplement. So in order to start this off, uh, we encourage you to listen to the uh, silly little YouTube video that we have for you use that handout that I just uh, finished talking about, right? And then I absolutely rely on your supplement, which contains all the basic stuff. And then we will give you the ID of the organism that we want you to work on. And then giving you the heads up again that the following session, you need to be aware that there will be a quiz, right? To make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, the process will be timed just as before. The only difference is, is that the timing, rather than being the hour in real life, here, you'll use the remainder of the lab time that you have when you attend your session um, or anything assigned by your instructor, which also includes removing the time for your lab practical. All right, you still need to complete your lab practical during that time. And then at the end of that time, you still have a couple of days uh, to submit your report uh, on Friday night before they're usually due. So materials that you're already been provided uh, we will give you a flowchart. I'm going to show it to you here a couple of times. That handout that I just finished mentioning, right? And then use all that information and in the instructions to finish off by Friday your first unknown report. So where are we going with this? What are we trying to learn? What are the key uh, learning concepts and skills that we're helping you take? Those KSAs that I keep on talking about that I'm going to explain a little bit more. So again, what I reiterate what I said a little bit earlier this is the same thing that happens in healthcare. The idea is for us to be trained to be able to logically identify the causes and origins of particular disease, the subject that I call etiology. For those of you who remember this from very, uh, very first topic, topic number one, and a little bit of the history of microbiology, we talked about a scientist named Robert Koch, who uh, eventually gets the name behind what's known as Koch's postulates, the current uh, and best utilized system of identifying uh, pathogens in a lab setting. That's what we're doing. It's more or less coming, uh, coming into terms of what a disease is and what possibly could be causing it and then testing it to see if we're right. And so the reason behind that in these days is just like if you were going to a clinic or a lab because you're sick is we wanna know what's causing you the harm. And the better we know, the better we can figure out what it is, well, the easier we can treat it. That's the overarching concept. If we know what's harming you, we can treat it most of the time. And so uh, let me give you a little bit of an example that I have sit over here on the right-hand side. Let's just say somebody shows up to you, you as a healthcare provider, somebody says, hey, look, I have this you know, little uh, thing going on on my right shoulder. It's very, very itchy. It's very, very red. And you, as a trained provider, you wouldn't just go, oh, it's magic. Obviously, you'd come up with a, a valid possible reasoning, and you could come up with certain examples that I provided over here. You could say, ah, well, it could be an allergy, type one, in case you're wondering. Uh, it could have been a bug bite. It could have been certain types of exposures. It could be something genetic, possibly, or the fact that, I don't know, they've been locked up inside their house so long that they're a little bit dirty, right? Um, and so your job is to figure out which ones are the possibilities that are valid, and then by a process of elimination, get rid of all the ones that just make no sense. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you at some point in time, because you've been to uh, a healthcare provider, they ask you all these questions that most of you probably were like, why the hell are they asking me this type of thing? Like, why do they wanna know where I was yesterday or why I was doing this? And so questions include anything from, hey, uh, did you travel recently or things like that because of uh, the reason behind uh, things like, uh, let's say, like a bug bite or a fungal exposure. 
Well, normally when you're at home, you're not really typically rolling around in the dirt kind of thing. But if you recently it came from a trip, it's quite possible that you might have been bitten by a tick or a mosquito or something like that, and that could have led to that. So again, we ask you these questions as a way to figure out possible reasoning uh, behind some of that uh, type of disease or any type of reaction you may be having. And so that's where a flowchart comes into play. And I'm going to give you an example of a real one and then kind of the ones we get to play with. And so that flowchart is basically your tool, your digital tool to figure out what are the valid reasons, uh, which ones are not. And so this is often known as a dichotomous key in our little field. Um, and the reason why it's called dichotomous is because it's based on this kind of very, very restricted binary system with two options. It's a term dico that you're seeing over there, right? And so it's a series of questions for those of you who remember playing uh, a game of 20 questions when you were younger of asking if it's this and saying yes or no, if it's that saying yes or no kind of thing. That's what a flowchart really is. It gives us this very, very kind of binary restriction of what are possibilities to answer the questions that we have. So anytime we have a question in a flowchart, it literally is meant to restrict you to be able to answer yes or no, or in certain situations, it could be just kind of more like a positive or negative, right? We can say, yes, it's positive or negative for the results or something like that, or in certain kind of scenarios, whether we accept what we're saying or reject what we're saying, right? And so this idea is we ask a question and the two options should be only yes or no. And we continue to ask these questions every single time until we figure out the identity of we want of what we want to know. And so this whole process of creating questions is a flow chart. That's what we're aiming to do. Now, if you look at the handout we've provided to you on Canvas, we gave you a real life example of what would happen if somebody shows up to your uh, particular uh, healthcare provider, your clinic and something like that, and somebody's kind of complaining about something in their eyes. And even though I'm not gonna walk you through the entire thing, I just want you to see kind of what the process is in, uh, in a real life scenario. And so let's just say that somebody shows up with like really, really, really red eyes, kind of something weird and gunky sticking out of their eyes. And so you're normally, again, not gonna be able to say, ah, that person must have been, you know, uh, cursed by a wizard or something like that, right? So you come up with logical answers that give you a very binary type of question. And so the first question we would ask is, does the person exhibit signs of, for example, pink eye or conjunctivitis, right? Or a version of conjunctivitis. And so you can answer either yes or no. So these are your binary responses. So there's only those two that exist. And so if you happen to answer yes, then you'd go to the next question and again, ask another set of binary answers. If, for example, they said no, they could be uh, sent to another set of questions as well. So if the person shows up to your clinic, uh, to your particular office, and they show up with pink eye, or they're complaining about possibly something it could be related, again, you have these two binary type of responses. Is it yes or no? Uh, if you decide that it's no, then you can send them to a different practitioner. If it's yes, the next thing you typically will ask uh, is, are they kind of oozing out from their eyeballs? In this case, what we're talking about discharge. Right? And again, a very kind of binary set of responses, yes or no. And so based again on those answers, you would kind of lead to certain types of um, responses. So for example, if it was really, really bad, so basically their eye was covered in muck, so we're calling, uh, calling a heavy discharge, then we can say, okay, well, this is how we're gonna treat it and rely it. If it wasn't too bad, the answer was no, we can go to a different type of treatment. Right? And so on and so forth, we keep on going over and over and over until we figure out which way to kind of go about it and which way to kind of answer or possibly treat it. So in this case, we're deciding whether it might be just, you know, something got caught in your eye versus it might be a virus, might be a bacterium, it might be a fungal infection and what type of treatments we have. So that's kind of that uh, flowchart binary type of dichotomous key si situation. So we also provide you another example. Again, this is solely an example, but a little more complex version of it that we do in microbiology. So this is what a CLS would do or somebody that is working in a lab in a particular clinic and they kind of go through the motions. 
But here, as you can see with the green arrows, we kind of highlight our path, our logic of why do we come to that conclusion. And so uh, here we could be talking about somebody that is coming with uh, GI distress, somebody's complaining about some sort of uh, intestinal problem going on. And so normally we will run some labs. So same idea behind somebody taking a, a vial of blood or a couple of vials or swabbing your skin or the back of your throat, taking a urine sample or a fecal sample or something like that. And then they would culture it, they would grow it. And the very first thing we do, again, part of microbiology is your gram stain. That is the quintessential stain that we learn in the lab, hence why it's critical for us. And that's why we actually end up performing it multiple times in the lab. And so then you get to decide, is it gram positive or gram negative based on what you see? Now, it is highly unlikely to be a gram positive thing, usually in the uh, gastrointestinal area. More likely than not, those causes behind GI distress are gram negative organisms, as we will learn in topic F later on in the future. Right. And so let's just say we find out that after we do our test, we find out that it's a gram negative organism. Typically, the next thing we want to do is do a motility type test to figure out does it move or does it not. You could observe this under the scope or you can do the uh, motility deeps or the swarming tests that we learn in labs 12 and 13. And let's just say we find out that it indeed actually moves. So we know, OK, it is motile. So we're going to proceed over here to the left of our pathway. Since we're figuring out that it's uh, moving, then the rest of our flowchart doesn't really apply to us anymore. So we don't really look at it. So we only focus on the sites that are applicable. And then one of the other tests that we take uh, is whether or not it has a capsule uh, and does it produce certain types of substances and metabolism. And so here you get to find out that uh, there's an uh, assay referred to as beta galactosidase. And so this one ends up being positive. And so again, we keep on kind of little by little playing this game of yes or no or positives or negatives until we reach a point in which the tests that we're running, for example, this is called a citrate test. We'll learn about that one later on in the labs. And then under a certain profile of answers, under a certain set of responses, yeses or nos, positives or negatives, we can come up with an idea of what a possible cause, again, the etiology of what's causing that gastrointestinal distress. Now, all of the ones that we're seeing over here are possibilities, but based on the series of tests of our flow chart, we more or less kind of narrowed it down to, in this case, being E. coli, the cause behind our patient's distress. Now, if they would have tested slightly differently, I don't know, let me kind of come up with something a little bit more different. I'm going to change the color. Let's just say that they did not, uh, they actually did taste citrate positive, sorry, test citrate positive. So they uh, turn their little sample blue, something you'll learn a little bit later. Then you can perform a different test. For example, you can run a DNA test, whether the organism uh, breaks down DNA or not. Let's just say it did. And then by running a different set of profiles, uh, ultimately you conclude that it's not E. coli, that it is a member of the serratia genera or genus serratia and go on and treating it accordingly. So that's more or less what's happening. So let me give you kind of a little bit more of an up close and personal type of uh, situation here. I'm going to list five different organisms uh, that exist. And let's see if we can kind of come up with a, an example of how to create a flowchart of it. Reminding you again that it's meant to be a simple yes or no, or very binary set of rules, right? That we can only see two types of options, right? And whether or not we could solve uh, those culprits. The idea is based on the yeses or nos or the positives or negatives, can we come up with it? Now, this is our list of possibilities, just like we did in the situation of the uh, pink eye situation or the uh, itchiness on the right shoulder situation that we described a little bit earlier. Here are a list of five possible organisms uh, that could be the cause of a particular disease. Now, I'm leaving this blank for the sake of practice so we can kind of go through this. And rather than kind of writing it out and wasting a lot of time, I'm just kind of going to do this in a very kind of more basic way. So let's just say you have five organisms. I'm just kind of drawing these out as lines, All right? There's five. Normally, when we're crafting our flow chart, we can usually number them so we can keep track of them a little bit easier, All right? And typically, these are also alphabetized just to kind of help us 
read the names and keep track of where everybody's going a little bit faster. And so again, we would start with our tests. So we craft up a series of tests that are again yeses or nos or give us some sort of binary answer to kind of start isolating them. And so let's just say um, that's our very first test. Now, by standards, again in microbiology, this is always a gram stain, right? So let's say definitely we're going to do a gram uh, gram stain itself. And what are the types of answers we can get? Now, again, by training, you all should already know that there's only two types of answers we should get from a gram stain, right? It's either going to be gram positive or gram negative. Those are the two options. But we also know this based on its colors, as you just learned in the labs previously, right? Uh, gram positive organisms usually end up giving kind of this bluish, purplish color, whereas gram negatives always end up giving us this kind of reddish, kind of pinkish kind of result, right? Something we discussed during the labs. Now, let's just say that when you run the gram stain, um, you get to find out based on your flow chart, let me get back to my colors over here, is that let's just say that organism number one is gram positive, organism number three is gram positive, and organism number five is gram positive. All the odd, odd numbers over here, or our primes actually. And then the possibility is that organism number two and organism number four are gram negatives. So more or less, we get an idea of what possibilities could they be based on just a gram stain. Now you continue to do this over and over with multiple tests. So then you can do test number two. Let's call it 2A. And we can go again, test number two over here. Let's call it test 2B or something like that. And again, you continue to run the tests until you figure it out. Now, let's just say we we'll go based on what we just learned earlier. I'm going to kind of cross this one out again. Let's just say uh, for this one, we're going to do uh, lab 15, which happens to be the negative stain, right? You can do a negative stain test or a capsule test, all right? And you decide, okay, again, there's only positives or negatives. In this case, does it have capsules or does it not, right? And let's just say number four is positive for capsules, whereas number two is not positive for capsules or negative for capsules, doesn't have them. Now, this gives us an idea of what uh, profile an organism could be. And typically, when we have organisms isolated by themselves, we just kind of highlight them saying, okay, that's the only possibility under that set of tests, and this is the only possibility under that set of tests. Now, we would want to do the same thing for the other side, right? For test uh, 2A instead of 2B, we would want to separate out these three organisms into something we can sort out by, again, yes or no type answers. So I don't know, we can come up with a different test. It doesn't have to be the same one. They don't have to coordinate or they don't have to synchronize. But let's just say we go with, instead of like a capsule stain, we go with motility. We decide that we want to wait, you know, a couple of days before we figure out what's going on. And let's just say we use the deeps, right? The little stab tubes that we learn uh, in the lab. And we get to find out that, let's say, one and five are positive for motility, so they make the tube a little cloudy, whereas organism number three does not. Okay, so it doesn't display any motility in the stab line. So again, because it's by itself, you've kind of isolated it, so you know that that's the only organism that can be under that pathway. But then we'd have to do another test to figure out, uh, separate out one and five. So there'd be a third test, right? So I'm gonna call this test three. I'm running out of space over here. Let's go ahead and call it 3A possibly. And again, the idea is something positive or something negative. Now, since we did the motility, uh, instead of doing the deep that we normally did here, perhaps we could do the swarming test. So we can do the swarm test, just like we learned in the lab putting a little glop in the middle of the plate and then seeing if it produces those cool rings. And let's just say that organism five is positive for uh, swarming and organism one is negative for it. It doesn't swarm basically. And again, we have them nice and isolated now. They're all by themselves. So what happens? We took our list of five organisms up here and we constructed a flow chart a series of yes or no questions based on tests we learned in the lab 
to isolate each individual sample to figure out the identity of a possible unknown. So what we did is we narrow it down to these five possibilities, these five organisms that could be the culprits. And by using individual tests, one by one, we can narrow it down to one specific one. And so let's just say that when you run the actual experiments, I'm gonna use color codes over here, use a highlighter and change the color a little bit. Let's just say that these are the five that you learned about. And then when you run the, the first test, which is, again is gonna be the gram stain, you find out that it's gram positive. And like, okay, it turned blue under the microscope. So basically now you know that these guys don't apply. We don't need to worry about them anymore. So we know that the culprit is either organism number one, three, or possibly five. So then you set up your motility test. You do a little tube, you do a little stab kind of thing, right? And you wait 24 to 48 hours to see what happens. And then you find out that indeed it does move. So it is positive for that motility. So again, we end up eliminating the other one because we know it's not it. If it didn't move, it would be organism number three. But since it does, we have to figure out if it's organism number one or organism number five. And so you set up your next experiment. In this case, we set up swarming. Again, you give it another 24 to 48 hours. And let's say you find out that it doesn't move. It doesn't form those cool little rings that we showed you in the lab. Then we know it's definitely not number five. And we conclude that the culprit behind our disease happens to be organism number one. All right. So that's what we're doing. And so you, especially uh, specifically for the second unknown, will learn how to craft these, which are a much longer list of organisms. Now for the first unknown, since these are training wheels, we've already created one for you. So this is the one you're gonna use. It's the exact same one that is in the lab supplement as well as in the handout we provided you, right? It's the exact same thing. And so here again, you see that our very first test we start off is always with the gram stain and you proceed through every uh, protocol. So what are we gonna do here? Well, now we've given you the map. Your job is to figure out uh, which pathway you would take or what series of tests you would do to solve the identity of an organism. So let's just go with, again, a hypothetical scenario just to test this out. And let's just say that we are trying to figure out the origin of a disease. And let, for the moment, I tell you right now that it is Staph epidermitis, okay? I'm just gonna abbreviate them here for the sake of simplicity. Now, the question then becomes, which path would you take? What type of results would you obtain so that you figure out that the organism is Staph epi, right? Well, first couple of things you'd find out is if you ran a gram stain, the uh, obvious uh, answer behind this is that when you do the gram stain, we know that uh, Staph epidermitis is a gram positive uh, caucus. It's a Staphylococcus in case you forgot its name. So it's a round type of organism. So it looks like kind of little grapes kind of hanging out over there, right? And so that means that if we were to perform the gram stain, we would know that our results would be positive. And so we could easily kind of discard again all the stuff we don't need to do. Now, since it's, its name even tells us that it's spherical shape and its morphology, we would know that um, it has a, a caucus type of arrangement or shape, so it's spherical. And so again, we would not look at any organisms that are rod shaped, so that's what a bacillus is, so we kind of ignore those guys. And then you see that the next test that we perform in this uh, flow chart is a capsule test or a negative stain, right? So that's in which we did that India ink one. We did the little 45 degree slides, smeared it all over, let it air dry for a little bit. And then under the microscope, you looked at this kind of reverse background, right? In which the whole slide was dark. And then we were looking for these kind of lights, uh, backgrounds, little holes in them with organisms in it to decide whether they produce capsules or not, right? And so if you did this, then you'd find out that, for example, SEPI is negative for capsules. It does not have capsules. And so you know, well, it's definitely not this organism over here. And so we have uh, three possibilities of organisms that don't have capsules under the gram-positive category. And so these are uh, Staphylococcus Micrococcus luteus, and Micrococcus rosea, uh, sorry. And so... The way we differentiate these three is actually quite simple. This is lab six, for example, we would do a pigment test. 
what color do they display when they're growing at a certain temperature or under certain conditions. And so very quickly, you get to find out that Micrococcus luteus under uh, temperatures above 25 degrees Celsius, it turns yellow when it grows. Micrococcus roseus gets this kind of pinkish, orangish, reddish kind of color. And then Staph epi uh, usually remains this kind of off-white kind of plain color in the background. And so since we know, or since we suspect that our organism is Staph epi, we will be hoping to see that when we grow our organism on a plate, it will look this kind of off-whitish kind of color. And so again, discarding the other possibilities. And so that's more or less what you're doing. This is what you're gonna be doing for this particular unknown. We're gonna provide you with an organism, a sample to solve, and you're gonna figure out which of these pathways to take and literally you're gonna highlight it for us. That's what you're gonna show us later on. So you're gonna go, I took this route and then this route and then this route and so on and so forth until you get to your target originally, uh, the one that you figured out. Okay, so that's kind of what we're performing here. So to solve our digital unknown, our remote unknown, our, uh, our remote version of Lab 47, we're going to give you already a flow chart that is already available. So that's the one that you just saw before. It's the same exact one. And we're going to provide you with your uh, unknown organism itself. And so that will happen during the next session. Now, again, normally we would provide you with a tube, right? A little tubish with a slant in it with some growth. And you would have to go, well, what is that guy? Since we don't want you to be coming to the campus then again to keep you safe, Instead, rather than you solving for the identity for the organism, instead, we're actually going to give it to you up uh, ahead of time. We're going to tell you that this is the name and the number of this particular organism, and your job is to solve for the pathway. Just like we did in the previous situation, you need to tell me which res uh, tests you would be taking to solve for it, what type of results you would be obtaining from this, and based on the lab manual and supplement, you would have to tell me why did you choose those tests and what type of results, uh, why do those results are, why are those results obtained? So again, the meaning, the purpose behind all of this. And so once you have your pathway more or less solved, you decide that it's going to go that way, that way, I don't know, that way and that way or something like that, um, you're going to write a report. That's what your unknown report is. And if you look at the handout, there's an example of how that is written. There's actually a couple of examples, the one that is more akin to what I expect you to be able to submit for the lab report or for the unknown report. And so at the end, you provide basically one or two paragraphs at best behind this. And then you're also gonna provide me with an extra little paragraph by you researching a little bit more about your organism. So yes, you're gonna to have to do some digging. And remember the rules, textbooks, journals, all that good stuff are perfectly valid but Wikipedia and uh, WebMD don't count. Sorry, those are not valid sources, right? But anything that might have like a .org, .gov, or .edu, uh, you can always send me an email to ask me, say, uh, Chris, does this work? Is this a valid source? And I can easily send you a quick email behind it. Now, there is really no maximum amount of them uh, in terms of the citations you need to provide. I shouldn't say no minimum in reality. You should have at least one, but as many as you want, you're more than welcome. Uh, the more thorough they are, you are, the better. We only need one paragraph of research behind your particular target. So what's the time frame to do this? Well, uh, we're going to hand you uh, the, the organism on your next session, right? You're not going to perform any of those tests, but your job will be, again, to be able to identify the pathway relatively quick. And then you're going to solve for the identity of it, which, again, we're providing you ahead of time. But within that same session, you're going to have to email me or email your corresponding instructor, your lab instructor. And so since your lab sessions usually run about three hours, we're gonna give you a three hour limit, okay? So that's what we want you to work with. And so you're gonna send us an email with basically your flow chart solved. So just like you saw me do, you know, you go like this, 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 you're highlighting the pathway and that's what we want you to email, okay? Send us an email for this. That's all we want, okay? You're not writing the paragraph, you're not writing the report. We wanna know that at least you're on track and that's what you're gonna send us 
within that first session. So we'll assign you the organism. You'll at least go through the flow chart, figure out what it is and send us a quick email. That way I know, or your instructor knows that you're doing the right job. Everything else will be due on Fridays as usual by midnight uh, in your respective portals. Now, also during that session, part of that three hour time will be dedicated toward your lab practical, which I'll talk about in a moment, right? And so you are using off a little bit of that time to perform your first practical uh, digitally as well. And so what we'll come to find out a little bit later is normally our lab practicals are very, very strictly timed and what you would be moving through actual stations with uh, hands-on uh, interactions, that kind of thing. We can't unfortunately do that right now because of the pandemic. So we've transformed that into a digital exam, just as usual, pictures, that kind of thing. And it roughly translates to a, a 40 point exam with the additional questions as usual. And it's done through Zoom as all the exams have done in the past. So what we need from you during that first, uh, second session, I'm sorry, is again, evidence. This is gonna be done through an email. We don't expect a confirmation. We just wanna know that everything's following or flowing and going correctly in your flow chart, right? And e only if we find something that is going horribly wrong, then we'll let you know. Otherwise, solve for your flow chart, right? Use the uh, template that is in the handout or even in the uh, lab supplement. Highlight that pathway. So show us what's going on. Uh, ours is a reminder. There could be multiple ways to do this, but you only need to provide us with one. You can select which one is your favorite. And then you have that three hour limit of the lab time to provide us with an email of that solved flow chart. Okay. So basically, step by step, which way you're going to go on a quick doodle. So all you have to really do is take a screenshot of it or, you know, print it out, draw on it, and then take a picture of it and send it to us. That's all we're requiring. So what will happen then afterward to solve the actual pathway, which you're going to be submitting in your report, is again, you're going to provide us with a step-by-step -step reason of each test and what type of results you get. And again, why you're solving them. So over here on the right, let me give you just a quick hint. This is not a test we get to perform right now. We'll do similar tests later on, but here's the idea. Let's just say, that in your pathway, you started off with this particular test. Well, you need to tell me why would this test be useful for us? What type of result would you be obtaining and write about it and saying that, ah, well, this particular organism that was assigned to me, okay, uh, happens to be an organism that is negative for that particular test and it'll help me isolate it. And we know that um, after a certain amount of time, uh, we will read that it's negative. Yeah, let's say it's 24 hours. And then you'd write about it. You'd actually say, look, uh, when I set up my first test, this particular test called the hydrolase uh, oxidation kind of thing, uh, I'm going to set it up at this particular date. I'm going to uh, set it up in this particular medium at this particular set of conditions for this amount of time. And then you would tell me what type of results you expect to obtain as well. Now, you'll notice that I kind of color coded this because we expect you to be able to kind of do the same thing. There's a little bit of a format going on in that handout that shows you exactly what we want you to include. So it makes the grading easier on us as well. So all of that is what you're going to be doing in your unknown report. You're just going to be providing multiple tests, not just one, on how you solve that. So just again, going back to that pathway and what you decided to go, whatever pathway you took, you're describing that for every single one of the tests that you performed. And so you're writing statements just like this one over here in a color-coded fashion, letting me know this is the test you chose, this is when you did it, this is what it required, and this is why it was done and what type of results you obtained and what does it mean. And so that's roughly gonna add up to about a paragraph or two, plus the research paragraph that you need to include for your report. So breaking this down completely is again, Normally, we would give you a live exam uh, sample. We're going to give you a digital one. Uh, you solve for your flowchart, the same one that you're seeing over here on the right-hand side. Step by step, either you perform the actual tests themselves, or in our case, a digital version of kind of describing which tests you're taking and why. And again, giving us which tests you selected, the reason why you selected it, any key materials uh, involved in that particular test the type of results that you're supposed to obtain and why 
were those results included uh, or obtained for that particular test. So that's more or less what you're gonna be doing uh, for their second session. So today was all about uh, figuring out what it means, why we're doing it, how we're gonna do it. And then the next session, we're actually going to start it. So now let's highlight again, what's the whole purpose behind this unknown and kind of how does it tie in with your first lab practicum? Remember again, just like anything else in lab, we have exams to test your skills. So how are we gonna do this uh, remotely in combination with the first unknown? Well, for this, let's get you going. I'm gonna re-mention or kind of re-establish again that thing that I call the KSA. This is a term that we use in academia all the time which stands for knowledge, skill, and abilities. And so what we're doing in labs and hands-on type of situations is we're looking at your abilities that you're learning in the lab. So this uh, more or less are the objectives. So when you wrote your pre-lab and you were talking about, oh, this is the experiment you're performing, that's the thing you're supposed to be learning. You will learn to be able to do these particular things. But then you're also learning some hands-on application, the skill set of things you get to perform. And so that involves both the methods, the protocols that you learn uh, in the lab. So this is what you'll write about in the pre-lab too. And then any type of key materials that were involved in this particular example. And then the last thing that you always included in your pre-lab was this idea of the purpose, uh, which is more or less the general knowledge that you're now taking with you of why you performed this, what was the big deal uh, the importance and impact of that particular experiment. So why, what are we taking home? What are we learning from that? And so now let me give you a quick example of the new set of free labs we're gonna be working with in the future. As we work into this series of labs from 19 through about 38 called our metabolism labs. So these are all metabolic assays, right? And so you'd be writing free labs for those too, right? Just like it says in the schedule. Now, if we were to break it down into, again, objectives, methods, and purpose, you'll see that the uh, KSA is kind of aligned with them as well. And so again, uh, if you eventually read this, I, I, we assume that you haven't done that quite yet, you get to find out that Lab 19 actually has about four different experiments in one. There's four different sets of stuff you're testing out. And so I have them listed here. Here's one, two, and then I'm just kind of for the sake of space and time, writing three or four down there. One of the uh, labs you're performing for lab 19 is uh, the isolation of uh, the use of selective media for isolation. And so you'll get to basically culture, grow, and isolate a specific set of samples by using a particular medium. So that's going to be your objective right there. How you're going to do it, the methods, is by using a very unique plate called a salt plate. It contains about 7% uh, sodium chloride in it. And then you'd set it to grow uh, in a nice and warm and cozy situation for about a couple of days, right? Now, the reason why we're doing that, again, yes, that's what we're doing, but why are we learning it? Is we get to find out that uh, gram-positive organisms versus gram-negative organisms are sensitive to salt. And so by creating a plate that has a lot of salt in it, you'll see that only gram-positive organisms grow, whereas all the gram-negative organisms kind of die. So it selects for that particular growth. So that's the reason why we're doing that. We're learning about uh, the importance of the cell wall and how can we kind of treat these particular organisms by selecting them. Part two of that particular experiment uh, is by using a different type of medium to see if our organism uses glucose as food, as a source of carbon, something that you're learning in your growth topics. And so, what we would do for this particular uh, experiment is that we would use this medium uh, liquid, just like your uh, broths that you use in the lab, you'd use one that is enriched in glucose. And so this is known as a glucose fermentation broth. And so that one, you would uh, inoculate your sample, you grow it also at a warm and cozy kind of temperature, but you'd let it grow between one to two days. And then at the end of the, of the the 24 to 48 hour period to find out if the organism uses glucose or not. 
And what we're learning again here, the purpose, the importance of why we're doing that, the knowledge that you're gaining behind it, is whether or not uh, this particular organism uses a particular food, which also helps us control it. By knowing what it eats, we can figure out what to deprive it of so it doesn't grow any further. That's the general idea, right? And so there's multiple ones of these. There's other uh, experiments you're going to be performing in lab 19. But what you're doing in this breakdown is, again, what are you doing, which is the abilities that you are learning from this. How are you doing them? The skill set that you're taking from it and any particular protocols and any key ingredients that you're using. And then what's the take home message, the knowledge that you're getting from performing this particular lab, right? Now, back to the uh, lab practical, that's what the lab practical is asking. For every experiment that you performed, what are the abilities, what are the skills, and what's the knowledge that you're taking for each individual lab, right? Now, in case you haven't kind of put two and two together, this is basically the equivalent of an SLO. So the same way that we work on this in, uh, during lecture, our SLOs dictate uh, what type of questions we're going to be asking you in the exam, and the lecture exams, I'm sorry. Well, the K KSAs are the exact same thing for the lab. What are the key points, what are the key skills, and what are the key importance kind of concepts that you're learning from here? So overall, let me change the color for this to make it a little bit easier, is our lab practical is going to be looking at, again, what type of objectives that were you working on? What abilities did you take from this? So what was the experiment doing? Uh, what skill set are you extracting from it, from doing these hands-on? So what are the methods? What are the protocols, the key steps that you took, right? As well as any specific important materials that were required for this to actually happen. And then lastly, um, what is the take-home message? What's the big deal behind this? What brand new knowledge did you obtain? So let me give you a quick example, one that will apply to you in the next practical. So we all finished lab 15 in lab. We all showed up. We did that negative stain. You all remember the, the two slides, the India ink, and disposing it in the little blue container. That's that guy, right? That's lab 15. So how does that translate into the lab practical? What does that uh, mean for your exam? Well, the importance behind that stain was not, oh, I did a stain. Obviously, we know that, right? And it's not that you did a capsule stain or negative stain. Again, that's not the importance. The question is, why did you learn this thing? Why did we make you do this in real life? And so silly answers like, ah, well, I learned how to do a negative stain, not going to get you anywhere. Okay. In reality, the reason why we did lab 15 is that you were looking for a specific structure. The negative stain allows us to identify a structure called a capsule, right? That capsule is critical because it's part of etiology. We know that most bacteria that contain capsules usually end up being pathogenic. That's why we want to know this particular test, right? And so organisms that produce this particular uh, structure outside the cell makes them a little bit more stickier and allows them to infect more efficiently inside the body. So that's the importance. That's the knowledge that you're getting out of that, right? Now, what did you do? What's your objective, your ability that you took from that is by actually performing the stain, by looking under the microscope, and you kind of learn to identify it by using things like India ink, right? And allowing it to air dry and doing that cool little slide thing that we kind of sh showed you how to do, right? And you also notice that in terms of the protocol, the methods, the skill set that you're supposed to be learning, you notice that you did not heat fix this guy, right, to preserve the capsule itself, right? You learned that uh, everything you're going to be observing under the scope was this kind of dark background uh, with some light shapes inside. Uh, depending on which protocol you perform, you might have used uh, safranin or possibly even crystal violet as our counter stain, depending on who taught you that subject, right? And then you took your, your smear, observed it under the scope, and you probably obtain a dark background. Now, I'm gonna just kind of use the purple color really quick under your field of view. And so you obtain something that more or less looked this kind of darkish background on most of the slide, right? And it might've looked like this kind of brown to black type of color, possibly kind of this off purplish color as well. And then what you were supposed to be looking for were these little light dots, 
inside of it at a thousand magnification, right? Now, those white dots could be an artifact, but also if we did our counter stain correctly, trying to look for this, if you use something like saffronin or crystal violet, you would have found out little cells inside of them. This is my awesome little blue over here. And so that white halo that you're seeing over there is the capsule. So organisms that have capsules like Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is the one we were playing with, will show this cool little halo around the blue cell. And so again, yes, that's the null, uh, sorry, that's the skill set and ability that you took from this. But the knowledge that you're gaining from the fact from this is that anytime you see an organism with a capsule, it's very likely that it could be pathogenic. That's the take home message. And so that's why we did lab 15. We were learning uh, the negative stain, the capsule stain for this particular purpose. So going back to our KSAs briefly, again is, well, what did you learn? Yes, you learned to do the negative stain, right? How did you learn from that? Okay, well, you learned the whole little slide thing, right? You learned that you use uh, India ink, which was our key ingredient, right? But then you also learned that identifying capsules typically means that they're pathogenic, that these guys can cause you some sort of harm because of that structure. That's the KSAs. Those are the breakdowns for that, right? Well, now we need to take that for all the labs we perform up until now, which is going to be in your first uh, lab practical, right? And so you have your first chapter, which are all the Roman numerals, right? We are not looking at uh, lab Roman numeral one or I in this case, because that was the check-in. So obviously we don't get to do that guy, right? But for example, two and three, these were your safety and cleanup. So those are still things that we're going to ask you in, uh, in the exam too. Those will be included. Right, but then we also learned, for example, how to do smearing. Right, we learned how to use the Bunsen burner. You know, what does oxygen intake mean? That kind of stuff. All of those guys are included in uh, in your lab practical, and then the Arabic numerals or the regular num uh, numbers that you're used to seeing. Same idea, right? We just looked at 15, and we learned at at the negative stain. We learned about the India ink. And we learn about capsules, right? Well, now your job is to do the same thing. So what happened in lab one? So um, our aseptic technique, for example. So what was the purpose? What did we learn from it? What skills? Uh, and so on and so forth. What we learned about omnipresence in our microbiome. Right. What did we take from uh, the pigmentation lab in terms of why do things produce color and what condition does it require? Right. We learned about motility and why do things move and how can we detect their movement by using deeps or swarming, that kind of thing. Right. And then we did all the stains. So those stains, the gram stain, negative stain, the simple stain and then the endospore stain, as well as the uh, acid fast stain, right? So more or less what you've been taking so far is putting together all the skills that you're going to be testing or showing us for our unknown, our first unknown project. But we're going to also ask you questions about it for your lab practical. So that's why these two kind of come together. So in our lab practical and our, the questions that we're going to be asking you are those KSAs. So for example, in the cleanup, simple example, uh, again, what type of knowledge, skill, and ability are you taking from that? Well, again, safety first, right? That's the one of the more critical things you need to learn in healthcare. Don't stab yourself with a dirty needle. Don't cut yourself. Why, you know, why do you have gloves? Where do you dispose of them? All that stuff, right? All of those are critical components on that. So that's why you need to know that. And those are the type of questions we're going to ask you in the exam too. But similarly, uh, for example, the stains, the gram stain that we learned over here in lab 16, what knowledge, skills, and abilities you should have applied? Well, you learned how to do uh, an air dryer heat fix smear, for example. 
Uh, you learn the differences between your primary your, and your counter stains, for example. Uh, you learn why do you use iodine? You know, the whole idea of why we spent only a few seconds behind alcohol and why we have to stop it right then and there, right? But ultimately, the bigger knowledge that you read from your lab uh, manual, in this case, is that the gram stain, even though it turned things uh, reddish and purplish or bluish and pinkish color, whatever, right, is that we were trying to figure out what type of wall that the organism have. And the reason behind it, again, is because by understanding the wall type, gram positive or gram negative, it helps us understand how to treat a particular type of disease. So this is all about treatment because things that have a specific wall like gram positive are usually easier to kill than their counterparts that are gram negative. Gram negative organisms have a much thicker wall, a much more complex wall, which is what we're gonna be talking about during classification and stuff like that. And so this gives us an idea of therapy, this idea of what type of antibiotics should I be using to kill this particular thing that might be trying to harm me, that's a particular pathogen. So that's what we're looking for in the lab practical. That's why those KSAs are important, okay? So understand the objective, the method, and the purpose, or again, the abilities, skills, and knowledge that you're taking from each of the labs. So as long as you can review this or this list of the labs that we worked on this uh, up until now, you should be okay for the rest of the exam.